All right, well then I'll, I guess I'll just start. Um, today's sort of workshop or that we're having today was on environmental justice and frontline communities pushing for a healthy agriculture. And today, a little bit about me is that uh, my name is Hector Calderon and I work for the Californians for Pesticide Reform, also known as CPR, as their community organizer in the Monterey, Santa Cruz counties. And I coordinate the three branches of the locally based Safe Ag Safe Schools, also known as SAS Coalition in Watsonville, Greenfield and Salinas, which were in Monterey and Santa Cruz. And a little bit about myself so that people have a little bit of context is that I was born in Mexico, in Mexico City, also known as El Embligo de la Luna. Um, I grew up in Santana in Southern California, and I'm a son of immigrants. I consider myself, um, you know, a protector of racial and food justice and food sustainability and food sovereignty issues. But I think foremost, you know, I consider myself as well as a, as a servant and a steward of land, earth, nature and the cosmos. Um, I also consider myself a landless farmer that loves watching things grow in plants and humans through its nourishment. Um, and a little bit, you know, about, you know, my own pro proper culture and traditions. I consider myself a warrior of those things um, that allows me to connect to all of these things that I've already mentioned beforehand. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, a little bit about Safe Ag Safe Schools um, is that it's a coalition of over um, 50 organizations, but most importantly, it's made up of residents, farm workers, educators, union members based in those three locations that I had already mentioned, which were in Watsonville, Salinas, and Greenfield, um, working together to really reduce the threat of pesticide exposure in the Central Coast and throughout the, the entire state of California. Um, but SAS works to really transform um, our current farming systems away from pesticide use for the benefit of our um, public health, as well as our communities and the, the environment in which we all, you know, steward and, and live on, right? And so that is essentially what Safe Ag Safe Schools, also known as SAS, if you hear me saying that, um, is about, right? And this is kind of the work that we've been doing here on the Central Coast. We can go to the next slide. Um, you know, what our region is called here in terms of the Monterey County is that we are known as the salad bowl of the world, right? And, and we know as that over about 9 million pounds of pesticides are applied every year in Monterey County. And California's you know, considered the number one in producing a variety of foods. Our region here in Monterey County um, that we live in is exceedingly unique um, in terms of the U.S. that allows us to produce some of the most, you know, demanding products that are con that are consumed around the nation and, and essentially around the world. Um, those being, you know, leafy greens, berries, and many other types of specialty crops that um, come from our, you know, very rich soils and um, region. We know that rural farm community families in the Monterey County play an enormous importance in the food system that consumers enjoy, all while farm, uh, farm working families are also the most vulnerable communities to suffer from exposures to, you know, dangerous pesticides, unable to really access the benefits like healthcare, and often facing threats of deportation are the, you know, many of the endless things that we hear from our communities here in the Monterey and Santa Cruz region. And so we can go actually to the next slide. Um, you know, a little about the region in Monterey primarily is that, you know, the top 10 pesticides that are being applied near schools, as well as through in, you know, near communities that are, you know, right near fields in Monterey County are are listed here and those are, you know, a lot of them are, five of them are, you know, toxic air contaminants. Um, a lot of them are neurotoxins. 
carcinogens and you know reproductive and developmental toxins that you know are some of the ones that highly affect a lot of our community members and farm work and families and so i just kind of wanted to give you sort of a context of those that are you know the top 10 pesticides being applied in, in our region so we can actually go to the next slide um, you know, right here, I'll, I'll be sort of just kind of touching a bit on the environmental racisms that that we as, you know, folks of color, BIPOCs, communities in the United States um, have to deal with disproportionately having to endure, you know, pollution or other hazardous conditions that, you know, negatively influence, um, you know, our quality of life and our life expectancy. And, and we also know that you know racism kills in multiple ways that can be the form of you know whether they be bullets or the form of exposure of industrial pollutions right and these are both forms of violence and racism um, that exist within our communities and you know racism is not just an, about individually held prejudices but rather racism works through a specific social structure and institutions that have you know, essentially been staked against many of our BIPOC communities that suffer from, you know, such devastating circumstances. And I think that I, in, in that exact slide that you'll, you're seeing right now, I give a, a really great example of how farm workers um, exposure to pesticides, ex, you know, experience these like unjust physical embodied distresses as a result of environmental circumstances, right? And here in the Central Coast, um, is an agriculture powerhouse um, where some of the growers really rely on underpaid labor or use toxic pesticides that create these really unhealthy work and living conditions for, you know, these farm worker families in these re in regions that are normally uh, rural, right? And so those are just sort of the things that I wanted to kind of like touch the base on. And if we can go to the actual next slide, you'll see that, you know, social and environmental justice overlap within these two, you know, circles. And as we live out our day-to-day -day lives, um, it's, it's really easy to forget how they intertwine our surroundings and act, how they actually are, right? And while the social and environmental worlds seem disconnected, if you look really close, you can then see that they are more dependent on one another than they might have thought, right? And so, we can actually go to the next slide. Oh no, not the video. Not the video? Yeah. Not the video, sorry. Whoops, okay. It's, okay. it's totally fine. Um, I just clicked. That one's it. Thank you, Jay. Um, so essentially, you know, what does social and environmental justice look like? Ways in which we've been able to bring uh, justice to our communities is through data collection of social and environmental studies, right? But I think most importantly, what is like the, you know, crux and crucial, like fundamental of all of this, the bread and butter is the power of collective organizing, right? And it is done through the, you know, lived, experiences and testimonies of farm workers and community members who live in these rural farm working communities, right? These are what make the most significant impacts to promote change locally, but also nationally as more of, and, uh, and more of the communities similar to like um, in Florida that is known to, you know, known for its agricultural richness and collective and be able to kind of like collectively join forces on a larger looming problem our nation hasn't necessarily addressed. And, and the reason that I brought up Florida is that Jeannie, who's also on here, will be speaking a little bit about how, you know, the Farm Worker Association um, 
Florida's farm worker associations are, are working to do very similar things that I'm already sort of touching on. Um, and so, yeah, that was just sort of that slide. Can we go to the next one, please? Um, so in this one, we know that through reports that have been written um, in California due to our agricultural regions, uh, Monterey County um, is known to have the highest percentage of students who attend within a quarter of a mile of these heavily sprayed areas. And that, you know, Monterey County uh, in general has a really high Latinx community and, and meaning that there's Latinx students are more like three times more likely to be attending these schools in these areas. And so we know that, um, you know, though children primarily near schools are a, a, a larger issue because we know that they're still developing and that um, they'll eventually be the sort of um, sort of bigger question about what that's going to look like when they begin to develop into adults, right? And, and normally those become illnesses and sicknesses or you know specific disorders that then become a problem in the larger you know health issue that we will be discussing throughout this whole you know actual workshop. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, you'll see sort of the stuff that we've been working on here in uh, Monterey County, but also in, in the state. Um, one of them was a statewide school uh, buffer zone policy. Um, this victory came as the first ever statewide school buffer zone held as a um, step forward, but more is needed as work is being still done on this. Um, because although the part-time quarter mile buffer zone provided by the regulation is an improvement over the existing patchwork of like, you know, county restrictions and community leaders and scientists have pointed to recent incidents um, as evidence that a bigger buffer zone is definitely needed. And that being whether that could be like a mile or two miles from these, you know, conventional growers that are using you know, highly restricted pesticides. But because providing only a quarter of a mile of a buffer zone across the state is only essentially a concession, but nonetheless a regulation that you know requires a 30 hour or 36 hour period between only fumigations, no other um, you know highly restrictive pesticides in the that are being used by you know growers or applicators, and that you know they they can't do them do during school hours. So as of right now, pesticides can only be applied, you know, per se from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., Monday through Friday. Um, and, you know, they can't be sprayed near schools and child care centers. And, and in hopes that we can continue to fight to see a full-time buffer zone um, that that is in the current, like a part-time buffer zone that doesn't provide any protections for kids engaged in per se, um, after schools programs and weekend activities and, and doesn't account for the fact that many p pesticides end up lingering longer after they are applied, meaning that, you know, we need to find solutions to then create transitions to eventually create alternatives um, are some of the things that, you know, that we're sort of demanding that um, as a part of like, you know, health or justice advocates are pointing out that, that need to be done for newer regulations to begin to start and that agricultural methods that cause harm to children and the environment are are not really sustainable in the long term right so that that was one of a really large um, victory that was being worked on in the state of california but also here in, in our counties right respective counties we can actually go to the next slide Another one that was um, great, another victory that was brought to light was a pilot project, which was actually the first of its kind in the nation. And this one is uh, called Farming Safety Near Schools. This notification is one of, um, that is for only fumigants, once again, and are you know meant to be applied uh, on farms within a quarter of a mile from school, school grounds. And essentially this was only providing to like you know, currently 10 schools within uh, a pilot project and neighboring farms, right? And so a system that that essentially would send 
an email or text notification to parents, teachers, um, community members, um, prior to a fumigation application in your pilot project school, right? And although it is far from perfect, it is a step in the right direction, um, you know, providing parents, teachers, um, students, school employees, and community with information about fumigants and only fumigants. Um, we are still looking to, you know, expand this sort of program and also expand the, the you know, toxic chemicals that are also being used, that it just not be fumigants, but more say all highly restrictive hazardous pesticides that are being used in the agriculture industry, right? And so this was just a, you know, one other example that was a victory as well, right? We can go to the next slide. Um, and so the other one, this particular slide is like, well, what are some calls to action, things that one can essentially do, right? Um, you know, one could be, you know, talking to family members, peers about the food we eat you now and how it's produced. And taking and you know really talking about it in terms of pesticides and the factors of how that is being done to our food right and so essentially being able to elevate our voices for that change a lot of us in other parts of the country in the nation or in california per se um, i know that every state has its differences in how ag commissioners function but um, in terms of here in in, in california you know, being able to tell your ag commissioners that, you know, you have these particular rights about how food is being produced and, you know, how that affects the communities, whether you're far removed from them or you're the actual person who is living them um, through these rural communities. Those are ways in which we can then begin to get accountability and transparency from, um, you know, those who are held in power with with these like sort of um, abilities to make um, rules and regulations and ordinances, right? Um, another one would be meeting activists in our in our county, in our state, and having been, you know, that have been really working to put pressure on our county and state officials um, and making sure that there's accountability and transparency on their end about how our food is being um, handled throughout the entire food system chain, right? So those are some of the things that essentially we would love for people to begin to ha have these conversations around, right? Um, if we can go to the next slide. And so in this slide, it's like, you know, steps to, you know, making waves, right? So we know that, you know, health professionals and scientists are powerful messengers, you know? And so begin being able to give, um, those comments from those particular people with, with um, you know, who are health professionals and scientists in, in this world, in our nation, um, you know, being able to give comments to the media or giving input at key times can really help for those um, who are doing sort of the groundwork um, at our, you know, cities, in our counties, in our states, because we know that these professionals who have high credibility with the public um, are exceedingly able to, you know, push forward the fundamental portions of the groundwork that we've already been essentially trying to be uh, fostering and cultivating here in, in different cities, whether it be in California, Florida, Washington, upstate New York, um, the Midwest, right? These are things that we need to begin to like recognize and and using our voice and collecting evidence in our testimonies and empowering the, the community so that then they can feel more empowered and be able to begin to um, get more public authority through their elected officials to actually speak up on these behalfs, which will then attract the media attention that we essentially need to create in order for there to be more awareness of the topics. and which will then eventually put some more accountability on our you know, policymakers to actually respond to those um, you know, things that we're, we're demanding them to change in our larger scheme of things, right? Um, we can actually go to the next slide. And so just a little bit you know, about us is that you're able to find more information on us through either our Facebook or our Instagram at Safe Schools 
um, Save Act, Save Schools. And if you go to the last um, very slide, you'll just kind of see that we also have a website, which is safeactsafeschools.org, um, along with the Californians for pesticide reform.org as well. And you're able to kind of, you know, learn more about everything that we've been working on. And, and I want to, you know, give a chance to Jenny, who will then be speaking a little bit more on her behalf of like, the work she's been doing with the Florida Farm Workers Association. That was incredible, Hector. And I want to say that um, California leads the way in pesticide reform in the country. And it's really an inspiration to hear what your work is there. Um, and it's really um, wonderful to see the programs that you're doing. You're really educating the workers and the community and making really significant change in California. And that really is a model for the rest of the country. So thank you very, very much for that. But I want to dig a little bit deeper. Um, Hector was talking about, um, you know, the conditions of the BIPOC people and the conditions for farm workers. And I want to dig a little bit deeper into that and look at the root causes. Why is it that the people that do some of the most important work in our entire country, feeding the rest of us, why is it that they are subjected to such horrible conditions? If we want to go to the next slide. So first of all, who are farm workers? The farm workers are the invisible people behind our food system. They're the essential workers, but right now they are being um, expendable. During COVID, they've been talked about being um, the essential workers in the fields providing our food, and yet um, they are continuing to live and work under really horrible conditions. So a little bit about the history, you know, the, the history behind our farm workers in the United States today is really the history of slavery. The first quote unquote farm workers in the United States, especially in the Southeast, were enslaved people from Africa. And the farm workers that live in our country today are living the legacy of that slavery. The, the, after the um, slavery ended in 1865, there were the indentured servants and the sharecroppers, and many of the black former farm workers that I work with and work for are descended from um, people whose parents, grandparents, great-grandparents um, were um, connected to enslaved peoples on plantations. So the history of environmental justice, environmental racism, um, social injustice, really is rooted in our history of slavery. And the farm workers that are in our country today have poverty wages. Um, they, a lot of the people today are immigrants. In um, 1964, after the Civil Rights Act was passed, a lot of the African Americans were able to leave farm work um, after the Jim Crow laws were supposedly ended, and that we still have Jim Crow today in many ways, as we've seen recently. Um, but, uh, and now our workforce is mostly Hispanic and in Florida, we have lots of people from the Caribbean, including from Jamaica and Haiti. Um, but why are people subject to um, a, a um, harassment, intimidation, discrimination? Uh, we still have labor trafficking in this country and in many ways it's getting worse with the H-2A guest worker program where they bring people in on temporary visas to work in the fields. So. The history of exposure to pesticides really is a history of marginalized people in rural communities who are living the legacy of slavery. And today, most of the people are undocumented. Um, most of the farm workers of the country are undocumented and they are um, subject to intimidation and harassment and they're afraid to speak out about poor conditions in the workplace. And the next slide, please. Um, and so some of the realities of the conditions of farm workers in the field today are they're exposed to heat, cold, um, storms in Florida, um, fires in California, pesticide exposure, um, dangerous farm equipment. Uh, agriculture is considered one of the top most dangerous occupations in the country today. Um, their living conditions are often substandard housing multiple individuals in families and a household. Um, they often live in flood, flood prone areas, lack transportation, and all of these things contribute to the conditions that make their exposure to pesticides and other health issues 
it, it exacerbates their, um, their exposure to these other health hazards. So next slide, please. Next slide, yeah, thanks. Um, it's really important to understand how the, the reason that farm workers are facing these conditions is because of a, 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 a phenomenon called agricultural exceptionalism. In the 1930s, when the New Deal laws were passed, farm workers were deliberately excluded from labor laws that protected all other workers. The National Labor Relations Act um, farm workers were excluded from that, which meant that they did not have the right to collectively bargain or organize to form unions. They were excluded from the fair labor standards, which meant that they were no uh, longer able to get minimum wage, overtime pay, workers comp or child, um, and there were no protections for child labor. Um, that's not true today. That's a little bit of that has changed. Uh, farm workers now do get minimum wage. There's still no overtime, um, and the labor laws for children have improved a little bit. But they were also excluded from the Occupational Safety and Health Administration protections um, that other workers um, are protected by. Because farm workers are exposed to pesticides, and pesticides are regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency, protections for farm workers are um, under the regulations of the EPA. Next slide, please. And I just wanted uh, one of the, because um, the conditions in Florida are not the same in California, um, one of the things that our organization has done is um, right now we're working on pesticide policy on a national level. So the Farm Worker Association of Florida is a statewide grassroots farm worker membership organization. We have about 10,000 um, Haitian, Hispanic, and African American members statewide. And we organize workers to speak for themselves. Um, we fought for improved worker protection standards for farm workers, and we brought farm workers to Washington, D.C. to advocate on their own behalf um, for better protections for workers under the worker protection standard. And the exposure of farm workers to pesticides really is a part of environmental racism. That term was coined in 1973, and that was the start of the environmental justice movement. Um, farm workers are exposed to chemical pesticides and fertilizers, and includes, including dangerous farm equipment. And more recently, we're worried about the threat of climate change and increased heat over the summer. One of the things that we've been working on is um, our concerns about the compounding factors of farm workers being exposed to both pesticides and heat. We worked with the Union of Concerned Scientists on a report called Farm Workers at Risk. And that looks at how increased heat exposure can mean that farm workers may stop using personal protective equipment, which could increase their risk of pesticide exposure. It can mean that by doing um, breathing heavier because you're exposed to heat, um, you're breathing in more pesticides, you can be absorbing more pesticides through your clothes. And so one of our big um, uh, projects right now is to look at the combination of heat and pesticide exposure. Um, and so um, next slide, please. Um, so this is just a little bit about the reality of farm workers. Um, we're also doing a lot around climate justice because environmental justice is climate justice is social justice. It's not, there's no difference. There's a lot of talk today about climate justice, but environmental justice is climate justice. And it's been that way for um, as long as there's been farm workers in the fields. Um, one of the concerns that we have is about um, PPE. Um, people didn't know the term PPE before the COVID uh, pandemic, but now everybody's using that term. And um, the uh, per personal protective equipment often makes you increase your core body temperature. We had a case uh, several years ago of um, a community member was working in an ornamental plant industry, Eladio, and he was applying pesticides. He had a full body suit on and he was applying pesticides in a nursery where they grow ornamental plants. And it was really hot outside and he complained about feeling sick. It's a really tragic story he complained to his wife, who was also working there. He told his supervisor, who told him to just go sit down for a few minutes. 
Finally, his wife had to take him to a clinic and the clinic sent him directly to the emergency room. He ended up in a coma and he died five or six days later. From doing his job working in a greenhouse, applying pesticides on a hot day. After a two year investigation, the conclusion was that were violations of pesticide regulations in the nursery and that his death could have been related to both heat and pesticide exposure. The nursery was fined less than a thousand dollars for a man's life for doing his job. So heat and pesticide exposure and climate change are a really big issue for farm workers and one that we're working on. But the Environmental Protection Agency a couple of years ago recommended um, atrazine is a really toxic pesticide and it's one of the most ubiquitous pesticides in the country. Um, and the Environmental Protection Agency, instead of banning atrazine like they should have, like other countries have done, they just recommended more PPE for workers, which is totally unacceptable because that's just going to increase the heat exposure of farm workers. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, so this is the, the Farm Worker Association also does community based research with academic institutions. We finished a four year study called Los Girasoles, which means the sunflowers in Spanish. And um, that study looked at the heat exposure of farm workers and um, the long-term consequences of heat exposure. So like pesticides, one of the problems with pesticides is that a lot of times people only look at acute effects, not nausea, vomiting, dizziness, headaches, but pesticides have long-term chronic effects, including effects that can affect the second and third generation. So we've been looking at um, heat exposure and long-term effects of heat exposure, which can include kidney failure from long-term dehydration related to the kinds of conditions that the farm workers work under. Um, next slide, please. Um, oh, okay. You can skip the next few slides. This was, yeah, you can go down to the bottom. Um, so um, one of the things that we have been, this was, this was how we tested core body temperature of farm workers to look at their core body temperature, to look at their heat exposure. And next slide. And this is how we man, uh, monitored their heart rate. And we did that and we looked at the ACT graph to look at their movement. Um, again, because um, they were increasing, with increasing activity, they, our concern was that they absorb more pesticides. You can go to the end, you can go to the end, the last few slides. Um, yes. Um, okay, and so this, okay, this is um, the, the, the heat exposure can cause permanent, uh, permanent organ damage or death. Um, and then the last slide, um, and so this is what the protection signal we're talking about um, that we were telling people to use. Um, but I want to say that in Florida, because the, um, the Florida State Legislature has been very uncooperative, we've been doing work at the national level. The Farm Worker Association is part of legal actions against the agency for several different pesticides, including aldicarb, paraquat, chlorpyrifos, and glyphosate. And um, we know that this is not the solution. The solution is getting rid of all these different classes of pesticides and going to alternative um, uh, methods of agriculture. We worked with the farm work with farm workers on Lake Apopka for more than 25 years. A lot of the farm workers on Lake Apopka were African American farm workers who were exposed to the worst class of pesticides, organochlorine pesticides, which are persistent organic pollutants. And Unfortunately, most of the African American uh, former farm workers have passed away, and all of them had chronic health conditions, including lupus, other autoimmune diseases, and we have seen how it affects the second and third generations of farm workers. So, one of the things that the Farm Worker Association of Florida is doing is community gardens. On the local level, we're doing community gardens, 
where we believe in agroecology and food sovereignty and empowering the people. As Hector said, farm workers are just landless farmers. They come from their communities in Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Mexico, um, Haiti, the African Americans, most of the African Americans in our community know farming and they would do farming in their own homes, in their own yards. So we need to bring these traditional agricultural methods and build community, build community gardens at the same time that we're building activists to work on a, a national level to transform pesticide policy. Um, I do have a slide which was not in this slide and I'll put it in the chat um, that talks about the different um, policies that we're working on um, at, at a national level that we can use to support to get better conditions for farm workers. And they include the Protect America's Children from Toxic Pesticides Act, the Environmental Justice for All Act, and the Justice for Black Farmers Act, um, because that gives um, sovereignty back to um, black farmers over their land. Um, so with that, I will conclude and we'll open it up for questions and discussion. Any questions? Well, maybe maybe I'll ask ask Hector. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how you work to empower the farmer community to speak out for themselves because of the intimidation that they feel, the threats that they feel, um, how they've been um, treated under the horrible anti-immigrant sentiment over the past several years. Um, what are your, some of your strategies for re reaching out to people and organizing the community and empowering them to overcome their fears to be able to speak out for themselves? Yeah, that's a good question, Ginny. Um, I think one of the ways in which we've been, been really able to reach out to farm worker families has been just through the term family, right? How that affects not only them themselves as farm workers working out in the in the fields in the cuadrillas and you know how that impacts them when they go back home right um, even though their children may not necessarily be in the fields with them essentially we know from uh, you know research and other um, studies that have been done is that a lot of the times their clothes their their boots, their stuff that they bring home and um, are interacting with other family members, whether it be, you know, their elders or with children, we know that that could be a, a way in which um, pesticide exposure could be as well, um, you know, interact within our, our family dynamics, but also how children, normally these rural communities um, happen to be at, you know, full 360 um, surrounded by either conventional growers who are using those exact same um, sort of highly restricted pesticides that you've been mentioning, like Paraguay and, you know, all, all the the name ones that we all know of. And so uh, we know that they're applying these and there hadn't been laws, you know, or regulations at many points until, you know, begin, people began to like take to notice and begin to um, you know, demand for these particular changes. And we know that children are more susceptible to these particular uh, pesticides that are being used, whether that be just with um, having a, a specific disorder like ADHD or um, ADD, um, or having, you know, um, neural developmental disorders and, and illnesses that come with being exposed either through uh, pregnancy with the mother or just being at school, right? Or coming out of school and being in areas where um, we know drift or at least pesticides aren't, um, they don't stay in one place, in other words, they drift. And of course, the that drift eventually ends up hitting all of these community members in, in very ways, as we know that everybody is very different in how they interact with being exposed. 
Um, and so that is a really big way is that, is that we're able to use, you know, children as a, as a very big catalyst because we know that as children are the ones that are the sort of most vulnerable along with, you know, our elders, not to say that adults aren't, I think that it's, it's just a, a way for us to, you know, hone in and really make to notice that these things need to, aren't, aren't going to be changed. Um, if we don't make those changes within our communities to, to begin to voice out whether there is intimidation, whether it, there is, um, you know, sentiment about deportation and whatnot. And so those are the really big things that we need to begin to realize. And so that's essentially how we've been really bringing in those, those rural communities into this conversation. Um, because we know that, you know, not only their, their lives matter, but also their, um, children's lives, right. That are impacted by these, these, uh, pesticides that are being you know, applied in, in these communities can, can really be, a a factor in all of this. And I guess, I don't know if you want to also touch on it, Jenny, as well. Thank you very much. And, and I agree. Um, it's really, um, it, we had one, we did a focus group once several years ago with um, women in a project we were doing with Emory University. And we talked about, um, you know, the dangers of pesticides and the women were discussing what their conditions were like, their exposures. And it's absolutely heartbreaking. One woman told us that she had seven children and if she was working while she was pregnant, those children were all born with some kind of learning disability. And the two children that were born, she was not pregnant, when, she was not working when she was pregnant with them, those children were fine. And at the end of the focus group, she said that she felt guilty for having exposed her children while she was pregnant. And it's absolutely heartbreaking. I see there's a question, but let me just say one thing. Another thing that we're doing that we think is really important is to work with healthcare providers because the conditions, you know, trying to, of course we have to change the, the um, conditions in the fields, um, but too often the onus is placed on the workers. Oh, you have to protect yourself. and here's things that you can do without being able to change the actual conditions in the workplace. So one of the things that we feel is really important is to work with healthcare providers and try to educate them so that they can help their um, patients to protect themselves and make them understand about the risks to pregnancy. Um, and, and hopefully they can begin to make some changes there. Um, but, uh, and and we've also feel like the healthcare providers really make a difference in um, being able to identify the signs and symptoms of exposure if they're um, trained in how to do that. But too often they're not. Um, I see a question in here. It says, I'm concerned about pregnant women in the fields and in other industries, women in pregnancy receive, receive special protections. What do you su suggest can be done to relieve this inconsistency? Do you want to, well, let me just real quickly, I'll just say that it is, you know, we've talked to women about this and it's very difficult because women want to work. They're afraid to take a day off. They're afraid to take time off for pregnancy because they need the money. Even if, whether they're a single mother or they're in a family, even if they have a support network, they want to work. So it really is a very difficult situation. We had a, 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 a case one time where a woman was pregnant and the um, employer tried to tell her that she couldn't work while she was pregnant. And we had to do a discrimination with case with the EEOC because she wanted to continue work. So there do need to be protections and education for women, um, but it's a really difficult situation because, um, and, and actually the, there are more and more women in farm work um, all the time. There's a lot more, there, I would say it's getting close to 40 or 50 percent in Florida because we have so many nurseries. So it's a very difficult, um, difficult issue. Do you want to respond, Hector? No, I think you, you answered it perfect. Um, Jenny, I think that you, I just wanted to, you know, say that you're totally right with what you said. And I think that 
um, you know, essentially a lot of these women who have been pregnant, they live on a day to day. Right. And I think that um, clearly there needs to be, you know, more protections for women it, that are pregnant, you know, just like in any other um, industry that we all are a part of to some extent. Right. That, you know, when you need to you know, separate yourself from your work, you're actually still being paid. Um, you know, you're on maternity or paternity leave, right? And so um, it would be great to see those sort of things where they're being still compensated and still able to come back to a job after they've, you know, given birth. And so, yeah, I, I definitely agree that what everything that Jenny had already mentioned, and I think that, you know, it's, it's really important that we begin to notice that as well. And, and also know that, you know, women who continue to want to work you know, are also protected because they're also bearing a, someone that's eventually going to be birth, be at birth. And, and there may be specific um, causes that could create birth defects, right? Um, so I think that there's there's something to be said about all of that. And I think that um, it's it's a really important issue to, to consistently be at the forefront. I see the questions rolling in. I said, it says the costs and benefits is that it would be cheaper to pay not to work versus paying for the defects from pregnancy exposure. Yes, I absolutely agree. Um, and I think the other question was, do you think that the recognition of workers as a concept can be applied more broadly for social change, equity and protection? Jenny, do you wanna answer that one? Well, yes, thank you. In terms of the cost benefit question, the problem is that the cost benefit, that the benefit is to the grower to keep his people working. The cost is to the public and public health. So the cost benefit doesn't is not equal on both sides. The employer doesn't pay the cost of the health care for the worker or the birth defect or the pregnancy problems. Society pays for it, and that's the huge problem. It's not inherent in our system. Um, for the and, and when the EPA registers a pesticide, they don't look at it from those terms because it's the cost to the grower or to the to the farm or to the supervisor or whatever. It doesn't, um, unfortunately. Um, and in terms of um, the 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 other question, I just want to say before while we still have time, we are in a really important moment right now, and and everybody that's involved in this needs to recognize that we are not going to get this chance again. Um, we just are coming out of a pandemic. We're still in the midst of a racial crisis, an economic crisis. And we have, for the first time in 30 years, more than 30 years, almost 40 years, we have people talking on a national level about, about environmental racism and environmental injustice. And the White House has created a White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council and the people that are on that council are dynamite. I hope Biden knew what he was getting himself into because the people that are on that council are real diehard lifelong activists and they're gonna hold his feet to the fire. And they're including um, farm workers in that and they're including climate change in that. And so we have an opportunity right now um, to really get active and try and make change and to push the envelope on this environmental justice. Um, because the question was, do you think that the recognition of essential workers as a concept can be applied more broadly for social change, equity, and protection? Well, I think not only that, but I think in this moment where people are talking about environmental justice, this is a key moment for us to act. And let me just say, I'm sorry it wasn't on my last slide on the PowerPoint, but um, there's a thing called the Protect America's Children from Toxic Pesticides Act. Um, it has um, support in the Senate. Um, it's really a pesticide reform bill. They don't call it that, um, but it would really make a big difference in how we um, uh, look at pesticides. It would ban organophosphates, which is a horrible class of pesticides, and it would really be a kind of FIFRA reform, the uh, Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. So this is a really important opportunity that everyone should be aware of and take advantage of and really support the passage of that act. And also the Environmental Justice for All Act that uh, Senator Cory Booker is, um, I think it's still, no, I guess it's Magoose. Representative Magoose is, uh, has, um, 
has introduced. So um, I think this is this this is the moment for us to try and try and get that. And if I can just add this in quickly, um, with all the talk about climate change, um, there are a lot of groups around the country, including the Farm Worker Association, that's talking about regenerative agriculture, not just organic sustainable, but real agroecological regenerative agriculture that will stop polluting the earth, but that includes social justice in it. Um, that it's not just about agriculture, but it includes social justice. So. Yeah. Yeah, and I want to just, uh, you know, thank you, Jenny, and everyone who was able to attend. I know that once 145 comes around, this session will end up um, sort of wrapping up. And so I appreciate you all joining us. And I don't know if you had anything else, Jenny, that you'd like to add before everyone leaves us. I would just say, if anybody has any questions, they're welcome to reach me at info at floridafarmworkers.org. I can put it in the chat. And please feel free to look at our website. We're hopefully launching a new website soon. Um, and please feel free to reach out if you have any other questions. Thank you very much and really appreciate everybody's time and really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this.